Hello everybody, uh, my name's Lara from Theatre of Science and welcome to this, my second interactive online science lesson. Today we are going to be studying air. So, why am I dressed like a flamingo? Is it because I've got two awesome outfits and I wore the other one last week? Yes, it is. But also, birds have got loads of things to do with air, haven't they? Birds need air, they fly in the air. What is air? That's what we're going to be discussing today. What is it? What's it made of? What can it do? That's what we're going to be looking at. So, we have a very easy and a very challenging task for you. I would like you to take your first piece of paper and just draw a picture of air. Noah, eight years old, draw me a picture of air. Oh. In Austria, you can uh, paint a pit, draw a picture of air as well, please. Now, you might be thinking, that's an impossible task, Lara. I have absolutely no idea what air looks like. It's invisible. What a silly thing to make me do. Well, do it anyway. It'll get you thinking. And it's very good for your brain to do things which you think are, are hard. So draw me a picture of air. While you're doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. Um, we have not one... Not two, but three experiments for you, that which you are going to do and I'm going to do all together. Matilda, I'm very excited as well. I'm talking in capital letters, can you tell? We're going to do three experiments all together. I think they, I've put them in order of most interesting, so the most interesting one is at the end. Uh, then we're going to do story time and look about how oxygen was discovered. Then we're going to do a little bit of exercise. And then I'm going to do one last experiment to show you the, the true power of air. Um, and then we might do a little bit of, uh, of kind of challenging thinking exercises uh, for those of you who are a bit bigger. OK, so have you drawn a picture of air? Doesn't matter if you think it's absolutely terrible. Um, I have drawn six pictures. What I'd like you to do, first of all... Hi, Leah. Leah, what I'd like you to do, along with everybody else, is... Point to the picture that you think looks most like air. Again, doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, it's just to get you thinking, which one of my pictures that I've drawn do you think looks most like air? So describe it, point to it if it's within reach. Good, okay. Now, on then to the first experiment. You should have two pieces of paper. Uh, one of them I would like you to keep nice and flat. You've probably got A4 paper, that would be better. Uh, and one piece of paper, I would like you to do a, a sort of scientific procedure um, called the scrunch. So you've got two pieces of paper in front of you, hopefully, one of which is just normal and one of which is scrunched. Now what we're going to do, we're going to throw these two pieces of paper. Uh, but first of all, you need to think of something called a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a posh scientific word for what do you think is going to happen? What do you hypothesise is going to happen if you throw these two bits of paper? Which one's going to go the furthest? Hmm? Big flat sheet of paper? Or is it going to be the scrunchy, scrunchy piece of paper? Make a decision. And now we're going to throw them. Nice and simple, isn't it? So I'm going to throw the scrunchy bit first. You ready? One, two, three. And now I'm going to throw the flat piece. One, two, three. Let's do that again, because in science you've always got to do an experiment lots and lots of times. Like, I'm left-handed, so maybe I'm throwing a bit harder with my left hand, so I'm going to swap hands now. Uh, Georgia Coulson, I hope you're doing this as well, not just typing on the computer. Scrunchy, that's right, Alison. Let's do it again. You ready? One, two, three. And one, two, three. Now, did you find that your hypothesis was correct. Did you think that the scrunchied bit of paper went further than the flat piece of paper? That's what happened to me. And that's probably what we were expecting to happen. But why is that? Why, why is that? <clears throat> um, to think about that, first of all, I want you to imagine a ball pool. <clears throat> Just a normal ball pool. Now I want you to imagine uh, that you walk into this ball pool, uh, you walk into the room where the ball pool is, and instead of all the balls being in the room, they're all floating out of the ball pool and absolutely filling the room. This is very similar, 
uh, to what Air is doing right now. So Air is just, we've talked before about these everything's made of, you could call them atoms or molecules, we're going to call them particles. So air is just lots of teeny tiny particles, so small you can't see them, floating around in the air, a little bit like this. They're bumping into each other all the time, they're moving around, um, and if you walked into this ball pool room, the first thing you think is, wow that is an awesome ball pool room. The second thing you do is you probably do this to be able to walk through it. Uh, because you would just know that you wouldn't get hit by as many balls if you were very small. Um, your big piece of paper is basically walking into the ball pool room like, yeah, balls! Uh, and getting hit by lots and lots of balls straight away and slowing down very fast. Whereas your scrunched up piece of paper um, isn't getting hit by as many particles of air. So it's getting further before the air pushes against it and slows it down. Second experiment. <laughs> now, the first time I did this, it worked perfectly, and I thought, this is brilliant uh, for an online lesson. The, every time I've done it since, I've just made a horrible mess. So I think you should do it quite fast. All I'm going to do is get a glass, half fill it with water, put a piece of card on top, turn it upside down, and then let the card go. That's what I'm going to do. If you've got the stuff, go to a sink, or have someone get you a washing up bowl, or a pan, and start trying to do it now. Those of you who are still with me, uh, we'll do it together and we'll, we'll just, just keep your fingers crossed. Okay, so I am half filling a glass with water. I hope you're doing this too. I'll, I'll, I'll wait a little bit to do the explanation so you've got time to run off to the sink or get your pan. <clears throat> it's so simple. Half fill a glass of water, stick a piece of card over the top, <laughs> Turn it upside down and then let go. What? I mean, what? It's really simple, isn't it? But sometimes the most simple stuff is the most amazing. I mean, what? what's happening there? It looks like water is just floating, doesn't it, in, in midair. I mean, that must be magic. I hope that some of you have managed to do that at home. I get the feeling that now I'm just talking to myself and everyone is in a kitchen soaking wet, arguing with each other. Um, but if you've managed to do that, don't move. <laughs> and very well done. Um, are you all back in the room now? Can we talk about how, it, how it's working? How is this working? Okay, so this is our second air uh, lesson, is that if you walk into the ball pool room where all the balls are levitating and floating and running around, if you look up, there's no ceiling. Those go all the way up into space. We are basically living at the bottom of a sea of air. Uh, so if you've ever been in a swimming pool and you've tried to swim down underneath the swimming pool, the further you go, the harder it gets, doesn't it? Because of the weight of all the water pushing down on you. We are basically right at the bottom of a swimming pool full of... Um, a massive, massive swimming pool, and that is what this is showing you. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but the force of the air inside the glass pushing downwards is not as much as the huge force of all the masses of air outside the glass pushing upwards on the uh, piece of card. So there you go, second experiment. It went everywhere, it just soaked Lucas' trousers. Yeah, see, mm, God, I, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of wet people out there. It, uh, use a wine glass. I'll let you just come, rein yourselves back in. We're gonna do another experiment with a candle um, and then you can dry off and try it again after, okay? When you can't take your anger directly out on me. Um, right, final experiment that I would like you to do. This one um, is a lot less. Well, actually, it still involves water, but hopefully a bit less messy. You should have a little plate with you. Here's mine. Okay. And you're going to get your candle, which is here. Um, if this doesn't work for you, again, you might just need to fiddle around a bit afterwards. Um, it works best if the candle is quite big, and it, it definitely works best if the candle fits the jar 
very well. So what you're going to do is, I'd like you to, you should have some, maybe you've got some cordial or some uh, food coloured water, some sort of coloured liquid. If you've just got normal water, that's absolutely fine. I want you to pour it onto the plate. So you've got a candle in the middle of your plate and you've poured your water onto your plate. Now what we're going to do is, I'll talk you through it first and then we'll all do it together. We're going to light the candle and then we're going to put the jar over the top of the candle. Now, you remember my ball pool? It is not a coincidence that these balls are not all the same colour. Turns out air is a mixture of stuff. Some of the stuff, some of those little particles are particles of uh, nitrogen, but some of the particles are particles of oxygen, which is brilliant for loads of reasons, but it allows things to burn. So, we're going to put the jar on top of the candle. The candle is going to burn all the oxygen in the jar, um, and then the candle is going to go out. Now, what else is happening inside the jar is that the air in the jar is getting all nice and warm. And when the candle goes out, the air in the jar, which is all nice and warm and moving around and spread out, is going to suddenly go, it's going to get a lot colder and it's going to sort of move together and that's going to create a lot of space. All you really need to know is that when the candle goes out, there's not going to be as many air particles pushing down on the water inside the glass. But there's still going to be loads of particles on the outside of the jar pushing down on the water. Okay, we'll just... That's people still telling me that they're wet. I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry. You, you asked for it yourselves. People wanted more experiments. So now get an adult to light the candle for you. And then we're going to put our jar on top of the candle. Okay. What do you think is going to happen? You should always think about that. What do you think is going to happen? Give yourself one point if you said it's going to explode and now think of something else. So we're just putting the jar on top of the candle. You ready? Are you going to be able to see this properly? I think so. Move me a bit closer. Got that. So. Whoa! Were you expecting that? Did you see that? So loads of water has moved inside the jar. Now I nearly said sucked up then, but has it been sucked up? It hasn't. Um, hi, a rerun please, we have joined late. Oh, that's okay, I'm gonna put this on Facebook afterwards. Um, I'll probably have to record another slightly smoother one, Debbie. Um, but if you've missed the beginning, then we're just doing, this is the last of our three experiments to do with air and then we're going to have story time. But you can go to YouTube and look at what you missed probably tomorrow. Um, yeah, so we've just lit a candle, put a jar on top, the candle's gone out and then loads of water has moved into the jar. What's that about? What you're seeing is the incredible pressure that we're all under from air. So we managed to make it so that there weren't many air particles pushing down on the water on the inside of the jar. So the forces weren't balanced and the mass of the sea of air on the outside of the jar has pushed all the water into the jar. Now, um, we made a bit of space in our jar. Uh, oh, I just spilled all my water. I am wet. Do you feel better now? I am wet too. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, let's get rid of that. There we go. Oh, my son's dinosaur juice is wet. I'm going to be in so much trouble. <clears throat> oh, everything's wet. Why? I'm never experimenting with water ever again. That's another thing that I can't experiment with. Right, uh, <clears throat> where was I? Oh yes, yes. We made a little bit of space inside our jar by heating up air and then cooling it so that it clumped together a bit more. But if you went somewhere that didn't have any particles in it at all, no air, that would be called a vacuum. Now, as far as I know, there's only one person on Earth who knows what it's like um, to be in a vacuum. His name was Jim LeBlanc. He was an astronaut and he was in a, uh, a special vacuum chamber testing a spacesuit when something went wrong with the spacesuit and all the air particles inside his spacesuit started to leave the spacesuit. Um, and he reported that he felt the liquid on his tongue uh, starting to bubble passed out. So there you go. So uh, it's probably a use for air that you hadn't thought of 
air pushing down on us is pushing the liquid onto our tongues it's pushing the we inside our bodies it's just making sure that no bits of us are floating away into space so that's nice isn't it um but air has a more obvious use which we're going to look at now we're going to go to story time you might want to grab a candle dry yourselves off watch my little story about the discovery of oxygen off we go <coughs> To turn you around there you go so once upon a time there was a man named about 250 years ago there was a man named Joseph Priestley <clears throat> now Joseph Priestley loved experimenting he loved fiddling with things he loved taking what people thought about the world and uh, proving that it was wrong he wasn't very good at showing what he'd actually discovered about the world. He wasn't very good at explanations, but he loved tearing stuff apart. Uh, for example, one day, Joseph Priestley moved next door to a brewery which gave off a lot of gas. And he said, hey, do you think I could experiment with those gases? And they said, yeah. So one of the things he did was he poured a load of water over the gas. Don't do that at home. Uh, and Joseph Priestley had discovered fizzy water. Woohoo! Wow, fantastic find, Joseph Priestley. Ah, you're saying so. The story of Joseph Priestley is that he invents fizzy water and makes millions of pounds and lives happily ever after. Well, no, I'm afraid that is not the story of Joseph Priestley. Uh, Joseph Priestley writes a book. It's a good book. Now, uh, he doesn't have computers because it's 250 years ago, so he just uses a pencil and he makes mistakes. And while he's making these mistakes with his pencil, he realises, because he's a real fiddler, that rubber gets rid of pencil marks. Oh, you're saying so. The story of Joseph Priestley is that he makes an absolute squillion pounds um, by selling rubbers all around the world and uh, makes a fortune off this fantastic discovery and opens up a rubber factory and lives happily ever after. Well, no, no, that is not the story of Joseph Priestley. No, <clears throat> the story of Joseph Priestley really starts when uh, he starts messing around with jars and air, a bit like we've done. So, one day, Joseph Priestley puts a spider inside a jar <coughs> and says, uh, Eh, everyone! He's from Yorkshire, he's Joseph Priestley. Eh, everyone, did you know if you put a spider inside to a jar, then uh, the spider will die? And everyone said, yes, Joseph Priestley, we knew that. Yes, it's, it's because of something called um, flagellation. Um, see, all creatures give off flagellation and uh, the jar is getting filled up with flagellation and that's why the creature is dying. Uh, Joseph Priestley wasn't sure about this explanation, so uh, he did a few more experiments. He put something else in the jar. Um, loads of people have put animals in jar, but he put something in a jar that not many people had assumed that this thing would behave exactly the same way as the animals. So, uh, you're Joseph Priestley. You've put animals in jars and you've learned that that's not very nice and they die. What are you going to put inside a jar next? Hmm? Have a little think. He put a candle in a jar, just like we've done, and discovered that it went out. But the other thing he put inside a jar was a plant. Now, if you want to just thought that plants would behave the same way as animals, and that if you put a plant in a jar, it would die. But it didn't die. And then he fiddled even more. He put a candle and a plant inside a jar. And just like we found, first of all, the candle just went out straight away. Um, but he left the jar in the plant for a couple of weeks and realised that when you put a candle back in the jar with the plant, um, you could light a candle again and it would burn for a bit longer. And this, well, it were amazing. What a fantastic discovery. Um, Joseph Priestley had discovered, well, he didn't really know what he'd discovered, actually. He called it deflagellated air. Um, but what he knew that this made sense, because obviously if animals and plants and everything on the planet is breathing out all the same stuff all the time then eventually there wouldn't be anything left to breathe with it and we'd die so it made sense to him that animals were breathing something out and that it seemed like plants were maybe sucking it in or 
plants and animals breathe in different things. Um, now he was very excited about this and he told uh, a scientist friend who was French. Uh, he said, eh, eh, you'll never guess what I've discovered, uh, deflage, this is air. And his, uh, his French friend, who was a chemist, said, um, no, Joseph Priestley, you have not discovered deflage, there's no such thing as flages, you have discovered oxygen, dear boy, oxygen. Um, so I'll leave it up to you. In England, we hear a lot more about Joseph Priestley because he's English think that Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen or whether his French chemist friend discovered oxygen but um Joseph Priestley was a, a doer and his friend was a thinker and the world needs both of those don't they so that's the end of story time um let's have a little think about oxygen so that is absolutely true humans breathe in oxygen plants give it off I'll very quickly just show you actually what happens Think about this as being water. Water is two particles of something called hydrogen and one particle of oxygen all joined together. Now, humans need oxygen, but we're really bad at getting it. We can't get it off water. If you've been in a swimming pool, you will have noticed human beings can't breathe uh, water. Luckily for us, plants need hydrogen and plants are really good at getting hydrogen from water. So the plant gets the water particle and goes, oh, hydrogen, brilliant, I'll have that. Oh, more hydrogen, great, I'll have that. Uh, what's this? Oxygen, don't need that. And just gets rid of it, luckily for us. Um, so that's why we need plants. Plants put oxygen into the air because they don't need it. And then greedy humans, we just suck it all up. Right, you've been sat down for quite a long time. Um, so what we're gonna do now is, I'm gonna very quickly describe to you, oh, who the French friend was. That is a very good question. Who was the French friend? Um, look it up. French chemist who discovered oxygen. I wasn't entirely sure I was going to get the pronunciation right, cat, so I chickened out. Sorry, Kieran and Fern. Um, yeah, we, I'm going to tell you very briefly what is happening to these little oxygen particles in the air when they go into your body. But to do that, um, we'll try and use a bit more oxygen to make it more interesting. So um, I've been watching these Joe Wicks uh, PE lessons every morning. I don't know if you have as well. Lucy and Ted, was he Eddie Izzard? No. Is that the voice I was doing? I'd make no apology for that. Um, we're going to do my favourite move. We're going to do some star jumps, just like Joe Wicks does every morning. Um, and while we're doing the star jumps, I'm going to describe to you what is happening to the oxygen particles that are in your room. Okay? Um, so, yeah, off we go. Right, you ready? Let's, uh, what's that old shout out? Shout out to, uh, to be in Bear down the road. Um, high five everyone, high five. I'll be with you the whole time this is going on. Come on, let's do turbo science, you ready? Star jumps, off we go. So, whew, you are exercising now, you're doing some work, and you are sucking in oxygen particles that are around you in the air. And the oxygen particles are going through your mouth, down something called your trachea, into your lungs, through little tubes in your lungs, to little sacs called alveoli and then they're kind of jumping across a gap and they're getting into more teeny tiny tubes that are called capillaries and uh, they're attaching to a protein called haemoglobin which are you still doing star jumps don't leave me on my own here and it's attached to a red blood cell which is basically like a disc which whizzes through your blood and gets to the cells of your body and the little oxygen particle pops off the red blood cell, pops off the haemoglobin, gets to your cell where it helps the cell do all the things that it needs to do to have energy and then that little oxygen particle is attached to a hydrogen particle and you breathe it out. So, hopefully, well, you're probably fitter than me, but you've probably noticed that you are breathing a lot now. Yes, it was Antoine Lavoie. Lavoisier. Well done, Claire Lovering. That uh, French chemist was Antoine Lavoisier. You're probably breathing very heavily. That's because uh, you need oxygen for your cells to work and your cells have just worked very, very hard. Your muscles have worked very hard. So your brain is sending a signal to your body we need more oxygen, we need oxygen faster, 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 faster. So you're taking big gulps in 
of oxygen. If you uh, put your hand over your heart, you'll feel that your heart is pumping a lot faster than it was before. <laughs> yeah, science workout edition, exactly. Um, it's, it could be a thing. Um, your heart is pumping much faster than it was before because uh, those red blood cells are uh, speeding through your delivering oxygen to all the places where it needs to be because your body needs oxygen for everything like everything like you need oxygen to digest your food you need oxygen to work your muscles like you just did uh, you need oxygen to think we need oxygen for so many things um uh, a little word about plants uh plants take in water like i've said and then split it and keep the hydrogen and chuck the water away. Uh, this is a lemon seed. If you've got a bit of time on your hands at the moment, um, a little tip from someone who's rubbish at gardening, just get a pot with some soil in it and everything you eat that has pips, just stick it in the pot. Something will grow eventually. You probably won't know what it is, but that's half the fun, isn't it? Right, that is the end of our uh, lesson, all the things that we're gonna learn. But I'm going to do a few more things to see if you've understood. Um, we're going to do a little sort of thinking exercise now with these balloons. So all I'm going to do, it's very simple, I'm going to hold these balloons next to each other and I'm going to blow in between them. Um, so the balloons at the moment like everything, they've got air pushing down on them, bouncing into them from all different directions. Um, and that's why they're staying still, because all the forces on them are balanced. It's like, um, like this kitten. If I push down on this kitten from both sides, it stays still, because the forces on it are balanced. So what I'm going to do is hold these balloons next to each other and then blow in between the balloons. Now, what do you think is going to happen to these balloons? Hi, Finley. What do you think is going to happen? Oscar and Harry, you too. Come on, think about this. I'm going to blow in between the balloons. Just give a big yes or a big no, and I'll, sh I'll show you, and you say, do you think this is going to happen or not? So, do you think that this is going to happen? I can't hear you. Yes or no? Do you think this is going to happen? Okay, do you think this is going to happen? Do you think when I blow between the balloons, they're going to do this? Do you think they're going to do this? Do you think they're going to do this? Let's see. Okay, you ready? So, holding up two balloons, blowing in between them. One, two, three. <sighs> oh. Did you think that that was going to happen? Ah, Lucy and Ted thought they were going to come away from each other. Yeah, you would think that because you would think, oh, there's going to be more air here. So I'm going to push them apart. No, it's weird, isn't it? <sighs> What's happening is I'm blowing the air in between. Um, out of the way and so there's not as much air pushing on this side of the balloon but there's still lots of air from the air around us pushing on this side of the balloon uh, so I'm blowing the air from the middle away and the forces are pushing them together it's like um, if you picture my toy kitten it's like instead of pushing equally um, I take this pushing force away and they did that Sorry, kitten. Um, just check it. Oh yes, I've now I've got, I've got an experiment uh, bubbling away over here, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, I said I was going to give you a more dramatic example of um, the force of air, because it's really hard to explain how how much of a pressure this air that's all around us is pushing down on us. So, um, oh yeah, that's right. The jigsaw got wet because I'm propping things up on the uh, soggy jigsaw that you can, so that you can see them. So what I've done is, um, you, you might be able to try this at home if you've got a very curious adult willing to help you and, um, <clears throat> and you look it up on YouTube. Um, but what, I'm, what I've done is I've got a can on a hob over here out of shot uh, and I'm, I've put a little bit of water inside the can and I'm heating it up. So just like we did with the candle experiment, um, the air inside the can is getting nice and warm and it's spreading out, uh, moving around a lot, and a lot of air is leaving the can. So the can is not going to have as much air in it um, as it usually does. What I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly put the can upside down into this cold water and the air, just like with the candle experiment, the air inside the can is going to go <laughs> like this. 
Um, so there's not going to be very much air pushing on the inside of the can. So what you're going to see is what would happen if you could get all the air out of a can. You're going to see the force of what air around us can to a can. Oh no, more water. Well, at least it's only me this time. Um, okay, it's, it's starting to bubble, so I'm going to do it. Okay, are you ready? I don't want to be a YouTube sensation for the uh, wrong reasons, so I'm going to wear my eye protection. Like I say, don't try this at home unless you've got an adult who knows what they're doing and has looked it up on YouTube. And I'm going to quickly turn the can upside down in the cold water. Hmm. Yeah, probably faffed around for a bit too long there. Um, can you see that the can has been... Did you hear a crack and see that the can's been cracked? Yeah, it was, it was better when I practiced it, but I only have two cans. Um, so, well, that's kind of good because it's probably made all the adults in your house actually want to try that again. So, yeah, I'll show you what I've done here. Look, I've got a hob. I've got a hob with a can on top with a little bit of water in it. If you heat that up and then you turn it upside down into a cold bowl of water, then uh, you should see something really quite dramatic. Stand back. Let the adult do it and do wear eye protection. Whoa, okay, we're very nearly at the end. Um, I wanted to talk about what would happen if you were on the moon and you threw the scrunched up piece of paper and the big piece of paper. There isn't really any air on the moon. So we know that on Earth, the big piece of paper slows down more than the scrunched up piece of paper because it's getting it, more air particles are hitting into it and slowing it down. But what if you were on the moon? Now, if you were on the moon, it's really weird to think that they would both travel the same distance and they would both travel at the same speed. Now, someone called Galileo said that this would happen hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but now we know that it would happen because 60 years ago, human beings went to the moon and we sort of did it. They didn't do exactly that, but an astronaut on the moon dropped a hammer and a feather at the same time to see what would happen. Now, obviously on Earth, the hammer would fall faster than the feather because the feather has a big surface area and lots of air particles would push against it. But on the moon, it would float because there is no gravity and air to pull it down. Very good point. So there is some gravity on the moon. There's not as much gravity, which is uh, why you can move in a sort of cool, strange way. But there is a bit of gravity on the moon. So they did fall to the moon. But they fell in a strange way. What I'm going to do next is ridiculous uh, because you can all look this up on your screens. But I thought I just kind of want to watch it all of us together. So this is a an actual astronaut on the moon holding a hammer and a feather. Uh, you can Google this later to watch it properly. But see what happens. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Thus ends the lesson. What I'd like you to do, finally for me, is let's come back to this picture. Have a look at this picture. Try and remember which one you thought looked most like air and see if you've changed your mind. Which one do you now think looks most like air? Have you changed your mind? Yes, yeah, some of you maybe thought this one before because I'm like beautiful drawing of some clouds. Um, I think it's this one. If you said that one, well done. You have learned that air is made of teeny tiny little particles. If you said this one, well done because you've remembered that air is made of a mixture of teeny tiny particles, some of which don't do very much and some of which are oxygen, which we need to breathe. Exactly, yeah, this one is the one that is the best model of air. Although uh, this one is the funkiest and it took me a while to think of, so well done if you said that one too. Uh, right, that ends our lesson on air. What I'd like to do is uh, now, when I stop the camera, I'd like to go away, have a look at your picture of air and see if you can improve it, see if you can remember what you learned to add some bits. What I would really love, obviously, is to see those pictures um, or just your soaking wet adults, um, any photo you'd like to send me really uh, on Facebook, that would be great. So off you go, draw a picture of air, dry off, subscribe to my YouTube channel and I'll see you next week. Bye! <laughs>